so uh, good morning, uh, dear students. Uh, today, uh, topic for the lecture is a part of the splanchnocranium, which is specifically for maxilla and uh, mandible. And then we are going to uh, discuss about the temporomandibular joint. And after that, uh, we are going to talk about the uh, teeth. Uh, regarding the first topic, uh, I have to uh, do the summary from the previous lecture with Professor Ferda, uh, which was about the neurocranium. So you know that the skull is divided to uh, two parts, the two main parts, the upper and posterior part is the, uh, is the neurocranium, which is enclosing the brain. That's why the name is arising from that and the lower part and the anterior part, it's the splanchnocranium or viscerocranium, uh, which is situate, uh, situated uh, anteriorly and uh, inferiorly. And it's making the face part of the uh, skull uh, as well as the jaw. Uh, All together uh, for the viscerocranium or the face region, you have 14 or 15 bones. Here is 14 or 15 because the one bone, which is called etmoidal bone, uh, it's a, a part of that, which is the cribriform plate, is belong to the neurocranium, and the rest of the part, which is the perpendicular plate and the labyrinthal part of the etmoidal bone, is belong to the splanchnocranium. So uh, those bones of the splanchno cranium, they are vomer, zygomatic bone, palatine bone, uh, nasal bone, lacrimal bone, inferior uh, nasal concha, which is considered as a separate bone. Uh, the superior and the middle nasal concha is belong to the etmoidal bone, maxilla and mandible. Among these uh, bones that we were uh, uh, talked uh, just mandible and vomer, they are unpaired uh, bones of the splanchnocranium, and the rest they are paired uh, bones. The vomer and the perpendicular plate of the etmoidal bone, they are uh, making or forming the nasal septum, the bony part of the nasal septum. The perpendicular plate of the etmoidal bone is making the uh, ventrocranial part of the nasal septum and vomer, the dorsocaudal part of the nasal uh, septum. Uh, viscerocranium is important part of the skull because it uh, houses the orbit uh, and the eyes. Uh, also, it's forming the nasal and oral cavities and provides the attachment of the muscles of the head region. So usually we have two main group of the muscles. <clears throat> in the head, head region, there are the masticatory muscles. Uh, and the other uh, uh, group of the muscle, they are mimic muscles. Uh, also, splanchnocranium is important because this part of the skull, it accommodates the teeth and sensory structure like a vision, uh, smell, and uh, taste. Uh, back to the main, our, our main topic, which is maxilla or upper jaw. Uh, this maxilla, it's uh, articulating with the, or connected with the, uh, the other side of the maxilla. It's connected by, with the frontal bone, it's connected with the uh, lacrimal bone, it's connected with the nasal bone, with the palatine bone, with the zygomatic bone, and also with the vomer. Uh, and the inferior nasal uh, concha. If you consider the uh, maxilla, maxilla, it has a irregular shape and irregular uh, bone of the viscerocranium. Uh, we know that the maxilla, <coughs> and you will see it also in the practical, that it has four processes and four surfaces. The cranial process, which is going toward the frontal bone is called uh, frontal process. Uh, caudal process, which is containing the teeth of the upper jaw is called alveolar process. 
the dorsolateral process, which is articulated with the zygomatic bone, it's called zygomatic process, and finally the medial uh, process, which is going uh, toward the medial side, is called palatine uh, process, which is forming the uh, more or less the anterior two-thirds of the heart uh, palate. Uh, maxilla, uh, uh, we start with the, it has four surfaces as well. The anterior surface, it's the ventral part. Uh, the orbital surface, which is mainly is uh, forming the floor of the orbit and partly also the medial wall of the orbit, uh, is called orbital surface. Then uh, this surface, which is toward the nasal cavity, is called the nasal surface, and uh, finally, the posterior surface, uh, which is toward the very important uh, uh, fossa in the deep region of the head, which is infratemporal fossa. It's the uh, infratemporal surface. So uh, the processes and surfaces that are important, the frontal uh, alveolar zygomatic palatine process, the anterior orbital nasal and the uh, infratemporal uh, surfaces. Uh, alveolar process of the maxilla, they are containing the upper teeth, of course, uh, the dental socket or uh, dental alveoli. Those are the sockets that they contain each uh, individual uh, teeth. Between them, there is a septum which is separating each individual teeth from each other, which is called interalveolar or interdental septum. And for the teeth that they are, uh, they have more uh, roots uh, or multi-rooted. Between the roots also they are the septum which is separating the roots from each other. It's called the interradicular uh, uh, septum. So uh, uh, this is about the alveolar process. And also in the alveolar process you can see in the, mainly in the frontal region. It means the region that they are canine uh, and uh, incisors, uh, you can see a prominence of the bone which is showing the uh, pathway of the root of the frontal segment of the uh, teeth in the upper jaw. Those are called yuga or juga alveolaris or alveolar juga or yuga. Uh, this is uh, because the, the vestibular side of this, uh, this uh, bone uh, uh, or maxilla is very thin and uh, 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 that's why uh, this um, thin compact layer of the bone uh, is showing the pathway of the root and it's clinically for dentists is very important during the extraction when you are doing the extraction. So you have to be careful not to uh, pull the vestibular oral movement, not to pull so much in the oral side or palatine side uh, because the root is going vice versa toward the vestibular side and it can break the, uh, this thin bone in the anterior or vestibular lamella of, the, uh, uh, of, the, of the, this maxilla. Another clinical aspect is that here, because it's thin bone, so if you have apply any anesthetic solution near to the tooth, so this anesthetic solution, it can perforate through this thin bone and it reached to the apical region that the nerves, they are going to that, so it's very important and used for infilt infiltration anesthesia. Uh, regarding the anterior surface also, here it's the uh, alveolar juga or yuga that uh, for the canine region, it's very prominent, it's called the canine eminence. So lateral to that is a thin layer of the bone, which is called canine fossa, which is covered by the muscle, which is called levator anguli oris. It's one of the mimic muscle here. Uh, it's called levator anguli oris, and it's covering the canine fossa. And this canine fossa, usually we use it for the surgical um, entrance to the uh, maxillary sinus, which is paranasal sinus, uh, one of the biggest paranasal sinus here in this region. Uh, medial to this canine eminence is another fossa which is called incisive fossa or lateral fossa which is a placement for the attachment of the mimic muscle like orbicularis uh, oris or the uh, mimic muscle that they are attaching to the nose. 
In anterior surface also you can find very important uh, foramen here, this foramen. It's called infraorbital infra foramen. Uh, this foramen, it's uh, uh, through this foramen it passes the infraorbital artery and vessels, vein and uh, intraoral, intra, infraorbital nerve and uh, uh, artery and vein. And uh, this artery and vein and nerve, they are, uh, as a matter of fact, originated and they are coming from the fissure here, which is the inferior orbital fissure and is entering to the groove in the orbital surface, which is called infraorbital groove or sulcus, and then through the canal, uh, which is uh, inside the bone, is called infraorbital canal. It's coming to the anterior surface, and then it comes out as a infraorbital nerve artery and vein, uh, and it's innervating the region that I'm going to discuss. So this point is very important for palpation examination of the second branch of the trigeminal nerve, which is itself, it's a fifth cranial nerve, and second branch of it is called maxillary uh, nerve. So it's the pressure point for examination of the second branch of trigeminal, which is the maxillary nerve. And as well, also, whatever you want to do any surgical intervention in this area, it's, uh, you can apply the anesthetic solution as a dentist in this area, and it's called the block anesthesia of the infraorbital nerve, which is very important, I'm on, and I'm going to show you. Here also you can see the contour or the margin of the nasal cavity by the maxilla, uh, which is, uh, which is, uh, 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 is, uh, is called the uh, preform aperture, uh, it's uh, is making the contour and the margin of the nasal cavity and in the center here anteriorly uh, there is a spine which is called anterior nasal uh, spine is the place partly is attaching the uh, septum also of the nose. Then uh, we are going uh, upward you can see the, uh, the <clears throat> frontal process. This frontal process is making uh, partly uh, the medial wall of the orbit. And uh, if you look at the uh, nasal surface of the frontal process, you can see two crests. One is uh, diagonally, obliquely is passing, is called the ethmoidal crest, which is the place for attachment of the middle nasal concha. And the other, which is more or less, is horizontal somehow, and it's, uh, is called conchal crest, and is the place for attachment of the inferior nasal concha. So the nasal concha that they are in the lateral wall of the nasal cavity, they are attaching to this two point. That's similar to this two point. Also, we have it also in the palatine bone, the ethmoidal and conchal crest. Uh, between the, uh, the crest, which is the um, lacrimal crest, the anterior lacrimal crest and posterior lacrimal crest in the lacrimal bone, there is a groove which is called lacrimal groove and the lacrimal groove which is the place for location of the suck of the lacrimal gland that uh, is accumulating the tears there uh, by the action of the orbicularis uh, oculi muscle, the mimic muscle, it's compressed and the tears is passed through the duct to the nasal cavity, and this duct is called nasolacrimal duct, which is open in below to the inferior nasal concha, which is called inferior nasal uh, meatus. So, uh, and also in the nasal surface, you can see the opening of the maxillary sinus, which is called uh, maxillary hiatus, is called, uh, and uh, uh, it's, or semilunar hiatus is called, when it's um, obliterated by some structure and uh, 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 it's very important and is the largest paranasal sinuses uh, that you can have it with the capacity as uh, around 25 milliliter uh, here in, in maxillary sinus. So it's the largest one and extremely is important uh, for dentistry and also general medicine. The relation of the teeth, the apex of the teeth with the floor of the maxillary sinus. Also, the posterior aspect of the maxillary sinus, it's uh, the wall, which is called maxillary tuberosity. This is very important, maxillary tuberosity. And to this 
thin layer of the maxillary tuberosity, you can see a small foramens and canals that it's the place for the passage of the, uh, of the uh, posterior superior alveolar nerve and vessels that it passing through this maxillary tuberosity. This maxillary tuberosity, uh, which is, uh, as a matter of fact, is located in the infratemporal uh, surface or posterior surface of the maxilla. Uh, it's, uh, it's bordering the anterior border of the two very important fossa that we are going to discuss in the uh, next weeks uh, is infratemporal and pterygopalatine fossa. So the maxillary tuberosity is making the ventral border of these two uh, fossa. So uh, as you see, this uh, maxilla uh, also is making a, a roof for the oral cavity. So it's making, a, it means the making of the heart palate. So the two third, the anterior two third of the heart palate is made by this palatine process, which is connecting together via this, uh, this uh, uh, suture, which is called median palatine suture. The median palatine suture, or in some literature, you can, uh, you can find as an intermaxillary suture. They are fusing the two palatine process in midline. And if you look at it from the oral cavity, you can see this suture. But if you, can, if you look at it from the nasal cavity, which is here, you can see the crest. So here is the median palatine suture, or intermaxillary suture, from the oral cavity, but from the nasal cavity above, it's making a nasal crest and is the place for attachment of the nasal septum, respectively the vomer and perpendicular plate of the ethmoidal uh, bone here. And uh, also, it's important to say that uh, in the newborn life, uh, this uh, place of the maxilla, which is carrying the incisors, the lateral, uh, lateral and central incisors, this part it's a separate bone in newborn, which is called the incisive bone or premaxilla. So it's divided by the canine region via the suture or sulcus or suture, which is called the incisive suture, separating the, all the incisor from the canine. But during the growing of the child, so this suture, it will disappear and you have one unit of the palatine process of the maxilla. But pay attention that in newborn, this part, it's a separate bone as an incisive bone or premaxilla. And to this part, approximately one centimeter behind the uh, central incisor, you can see a foramen. This foramen is called incisive foramen, incisive foramen. And uh, this incisive foramen is another foramen that dentistry or uh, doctor or dentist, they are applying the anesthesia here, is the block anesthesia to here, which is for the numbness of the nasopalatine nerve. Of course, accompanied with the nerve, it passes the vessels with the same name, the nasopalatine vessels here in this foramen. So it's very uh, somehow painful, but uh, it's whenever you want to do anything with the incisors plus minus the canine, uh, so you can apply the uh, block anesthesia at the incisive uh, foramen for the numbness of the uh, nasopalatine uh, nerve. To this palatine process that you can see a very roughness here in the oral side, in the, in the nasal side it's a smooth, but in oral side you see the roughness for the placing of the salivary, uh, minor salivary glands or palatine glands, and also some grooves that they are called the grooves for the uh, palatine, greater palatine nerve and vessels. And here, according to its name, so it passed the greater palatine nerve and vessels to this side and is innervating the palatine aspect of the uh, of the premolar region and the molar region that is arising from the greater palatine foramen that it's located in the palatine uh, bone. <clears throat> then, uh, of course, uh, here, as we said, that the orbital, uh, orbital surface is making a floor of the orbit. And uh, also, in this case, you have the roof of the roof of the maxillary sinus. <clears throat> so it's clinically important 
that if you have some heat uh, from anterior side to your orbital region, uh, usually this object must be uh, bigger than the diameter of the orbit. So it can cause the fracture of the uh, floor of the orbit. In this case, it's a fracture of the roof of the maxillary sinus. And uh, it's called blowout fracture. And it's very important that it can cause the herniation of the uh, content of the orbit to the maxillary sinus and bleeding to the maxillary sinus that I'm going to uh, show you the following uh, following uh, uh, slides. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, this is important uh, about the fracture of the maxilla uh, because we uh, in the mid facial region or mid face region we classified the fracture of the maxilla to the according to the uh, scientist which is which was called Lefort. So we have Lefort one. Lefort 2 and Lefort 3. Uh, and as you see, according to the line of the fracture, the Lefort 1 and Lefort 2, it can influence the wall of the maxillary sinus. So <clears throat> if you consider the Lefort 1 or the lower subzygomatic uh, fracture, <clears throat> this fracture is uh, passing through the, above the apex of the uh, upper teeth and above the heart palate to the floor of the nasal cavity. So if there is a fracture which is usually uh, is bilateral, uh, it's uh, disturbing the anterior wall of the maxillary sinus, so it's a communication between the maxillary sinus and uh, outside. Uh, Lefort 1, you can see it in this picture. <clears throat> the two fracture, the double fracture of the Lefort here, in the 3D reconstructor uh, picture, so this is the Lefort 1. The Lefort 2, which is, looks like a pyramidal shape, is called pyramid or upper, uh, upper, uh, not, uh, not lower, upper subzygomatic uh, fracture that is uh, starting from the root of the nose and uh, it's going to the medial wall of the orbit. It's involving the lacrimal and ethmoidal bone to the inferior orbital fissure and it passed through the maxilla, mainly the uh, connection of the maxilla with the zygomatic bone, uh, zygomatico maxillary suture. So it's also involving the maxillary uh, sinus. But uh, Lefort 3, which is more or less horizontally and is just involving the frontal process of the uh, maxilla, so it doesn't involve the maxillary sinus, but it's very dangerous because of the leakage of the cerebrospinal fluid uh, through the, uh, through the uh, central nervous system through the, uh, uh, to the orofacial region. So conclusion is that the Lefort 1 and Lefort 2, uh, they are uh, making a broken of the wall of the maxillary uh, uh, sinus, not Lefort 3, and this is the CT scan that you can see the maxillary sinus, which is usually it must be transparent without any, uh, any, any <coughs> uh, other structure. It's just filled by the air. So that's why it's, it's called paranasal sinuses. Uh, and uh, here you can see the anterior wall fracture of this sign if you compare it with the other uh, side. And this is what I am going, uh, what I was talking about. It's a blowout fracture that if uh, usually by the fist or by the ball, uh, the object, it can be anything that is bigger than the object in the, the diameter of the orbit. So if it come to your, from anterior side to your eyes, it's making, uh, increasing the hydraulic pressure inside the eye and this pressure must be released and it will be releasing through the weak aspect of the orbit. And this is the lower wall of the orbit and medial wall of the orbit. So when it's breaking this uh, lower uh, wall of the orbit, then it's the upper wall of the maxillary sinus. And then if you do the X-ray, so this is the fracture line. So you see that here is completely, here is maxillary sinus clear, but here is the fracture of the inferior wall of the orbit and you see that the blood is coming inside the maxillary sinus and clinically for you is important to recognize the part of the blood and some emphysema or part of the air that is going inside and is the <clears throat> pathology. So the topographical relation of the maxillary sinus 
the roof of the maxillary sinus and floor of the orbital uh, region is very important aspect for this kind of fracture, which is called blowout fracture. And then if you do the X-ray, you can see the level that is filling the maxillary sinus, and this level, it's mostly due to the trauma, is blood, and due to the infection, it can be a exudation. Of course, inside the maxillary sinus, it uh, can be a cyst that is not the level, then there is a convexity uh, in the maxillary sinus. And what I wanted to tell you for the dentistry, and I talked also about this, it's the tuber maxilla again, that is very thin, and you have to pay attention that during the extraction of the upper maxillary wisdom teeth, which is sometimes is fusing and is ankylotic with the, uh, with the bone, and by the uh, not, uh, if you don't be careful uh, for this extraction, you can break this uh, maxillary tuberosity, and you can open the way from the oral cavity to the maxillary sinus, which is not good because the bacteria that you have it in oral cavity is not proper and is not suit suitable for the maxillary sinus, then you have the infection in maxillary sinus. So for one aspect clinical, the other is that here we said that in the infratemporal surface or maxillary tuberosity, here you have the uh, posterior superior alveolar nerves. You can apply the block anesthesia here in this region and uh, the other clinical aspect is the relation of the apex of the usually distal teeth. It means the molars and sometimes premolar as, as well. It can have a close relation with the maxillary sinus or sometimes they are inside the maxillary sinus. Since the tooth, they are located inside the mouth, so there is no communication, but immediately when you extract, so you open the way from the oral cavity to the maxillary sinus, and there is a oro-antral communication, and that's why we said it, that always after the extraction of the distal teeth, you have to do the test, which is closing your, the nose of the patient and ask the patient to blow the nose with the open mouth. If the pressure, it goes to the ear, it means there is no oral communication. But if it is a communication, the air is coming from the extraction socket, and then immediately you have to close this wound to prevent the entrance of the bacteria to the maxillary sinus. So, <clears throat> so while you are teaching or while you are learning, uh, this structure is that in future life, uh, especially the dentist or sometimes also general medicine, they are forced to apply anesthesia and this is the anesthesia, the block anesthesia for the maxillary, at the maxillary tuberosity for the posterior superior alveolar nerve that they are passing. And uh, this is the place and the direction of the needle is very important because if you do, instead of the toward the maxillary tuberosity in the infratemporal surface, if you go a little bit laterally here, there is a big plexus, venous plexus, which is called pterygoid venous plexus, and you can puncture this uh, plexus. It's caused a severe bleeding that the patient has the swallowing in the face instead of the numbness. And this is the area, the bluish, the blue color, is the area that is supplied by the posterior superior alveolar nerve. So by the blocking of this nerve, so you can do the numbness of the molar region. So as you see here, the first premolar in the medial, medial side, uh, it's not colored, so it's plus minus because the mesial side of the first molar, it can receive the innervation from the middle superior alveolar nerve, not posterior superior alveolar nerve. And uh, here is also the infraorbital nerve block that I said. Here, when the nerve is coming out from the foramen, it gives four branches, and those branches are called pes anserinus minor. Pes anserinus major was in? in the tibia, in the medial aspect of the tibia is the place of the attachment of the three muscles. So here is pes anserinus minor, is the branches of the infraorbital nerve, uh, which is the inferior palpebral nerve, which is supplying the sensitive innervation of the lower eyelid. Uh, then the external nasal nerve, which is supplying the nasal wing, or a wing of the nose, or alanasi. 
the internal nasal nerve, which is not here, is innervating the nasal vestibule, and the superior labial nerve, which is innervating the, uh, the upper lip. So all these branches, they are innervating all this bluish area. So if you do the injection at the foramen, so you can do the numbness and anesthetize all, all this region, and you can do any uh, surgical intervention in this <clears throat> area. And this is the view of the area of the innervation of the infraorbital <clears throat> uh, nerve block. So <clears throat> next topic is uh, mandible. As you see, the mandible is the <clears throat> only movable part of the splanchnocranium, and it's uh, joining with the uh, temporal bone uh, that we are going to discuss which part. So is forming the temporomandibular uh, joint. So the main, uh, uh, main uh, parts of the uh, mandible, its body, its angle, its ascending part, which is called ramus. Then at the end of ramus, you have the, condyl, uh, the coronoid uh, process, which is anteriorly, sometimes it's called muscular process because the temporalis muscle or temporal muscle is attaching here or is inserted here. And the posteriorly is the condylar process, which is making or forming the head of the mandible. So in newborn also, we had two parts of the mandible that they are fusing in the midline as a, a symphysis menti or mental symphysis here. And usually with the age of one till two, it's, it's, it's just a fibrous connection. It's not a higher lane connection, it's a fibrous connection. And uh, by the year one or two, so it will be fused and you have just one mandible in this area. So uh, the details of this bone, as you know, the mandible is the most uh, largest, strongest, and lowest part of the bone in the splachnocranium. So it's the first bone that in any injury, it will be involved, yes? So whatever you have some heat from any side, so usually the mandible, it will be damaged. So that's why this bone is the one-fifth of the facial injury involved in the, uh, in the mandibular fracture. So uh, the position of this bone, it's uh, important uh, according to the traumatology. Another important aspect of the mandibular, like uh, maxilla, so you have the, you have the uh, alveolar process, and this alveolar process, it has a dental alveoli or dental socket that they have the tooth between them, interalveolar or interdental septum. And for the multi-rooted, like a molar, between the roots, there are interradicular uh, septum is located. Uh, it's important also uh, that in the uh, old patients that they are losing the uh, teeth, so then is starting the uh, atrophying, atrophizing of the uh, height of the uh, alveolar process of the, uh, of the mandible because the pressure of the masticatory muscle is missing. So, and then when it's missing, so the height of the alveolar process is reduced and reduced till to the place of the attachment of the muscle. So that's why in older people, this foramen that is located here, I'm going to discuss, so it can be on the surface of the alveolar process and by using of the denture in old people, so they have the pressure in the mental nerve that it can be painful. So this is uh, important. So here in the mental region, uh, it's the triangular shape structure which is called mental protuberance. This is making a chin of uh, the face and uh, lateral to that, uh, it's the two, uh, two tubercle, which is called mental tubercle, one is left, one is right. And if you go to the inner surface, then you see two fossa, which is called digastric fossa for attachment of the anterior belly of digastric muscle. 
So that's why they call it digastric uh, fossa. And then if you continue to the inner surface of the mandible in the midline, so you see the uh, mental spine. This mental spine usually, it's, there are two. One is superior, one is inferior mental spine. To the superior mental spine is attaching the uh, genioglossus muscle, and to the inferior one is attaching the genio uh, hyoid muscle. Those are the muscle that we are going to discuss. Uh, genioglossus is a muscle of the tongue, and geniohyoid is suprahyoid muscle, which is involving during to the depression of the mandible. It means when you open your mouth. Uh, then back to this place, which is the mental foramen, very important uh, foramen. And uh, this foramen, as a matter of fact, is the ending of the canal, which is originated and starting from this foramen, which is called mandibular foramen. In the inner surface of the ramus of the mandible, you can see a foramen, which is called mandibular uh, foramen. Uh, and inside the bone, it continues as a mandibular canal, and it ends up to this foramen, which is called mental uh, foramen. Through the mandibular foramen and mandibular canal, it passes the inferior alveolar nerve. Oh my God, it's the most important nerve for the dentistry, uh, for the lower jaw, and it's a branch of the mandibular nerve, which is the third branch of the trigeminal nerve, together with the artery and veins, the same name. So inferior alveolar nerve, artery, vein, they are entering to this foramen, they passing through whole bone inside, and then it coming out here as an end branch of this inferior alveolar nerve artery vein as a mental nerve artery vein, which is supplying the lower lip and the, the chin uh, region, this, uh, this uh, nerve. So uh, this is uh, clinically also, in this case, is important for the examination of the third branch of the trigeminal nerve, so by the pressure of this mental foramen, which is located usually under the uh, apex of the second premolar. So this is the typical place of the mental foramen under the apex of the second premolar, or sometimes they write it that it's under and between the apex of the first and second premolar is located. It's the pressure point for the examination of the third branch of the trigeminal nerve, as well as the place for the application of the block anesthesia at the mental foramen for the numbness of the lower lip and the chin region if you want to do anything here in this uh, area. So we go further to the angle of the mandible which is called uh, the mandibular angle. The mandibular angle, it has two surfaces. One is outer surface and the other is inner surface here. The outer surface is the place for attachment of the superficial uh, head of the masseter muscle, one of the masticatory muscle, which is <clears throat> called masseteric tuberosity here. And in inner surface is the place for the attachment of the medial pterygoid muscle, which is uh, another masticatory muscle. That's why here in inner surface of the angle of the mandible, it's, uh, it's the pterygoid tuberosity. Angle of the mandible in the adult, we have a sharp angle, so approximately is 110 to 120 degree, but in newborn and also older people, edentulous people, this angle is shifting backward and in this angle it will be increased, the size. So it's approximately 150 degrees, so it's called obtuse angle or not sharp angle for the newborn and odontolous patient. If you go farther upward, so you reach to the ramus of the mandible, which is uh, usually the place for attachment of the deep portion of the masseter muscle in the outer surface. And then you go up to the, these two processes, the coronoid process or muscular process for attachment of the, mus uh, the temporal muscle, the another masticatory muscle, and the other is condylar process or is forming the head of the mandible. Between these two, there are the mandibular notch and through this notch it passes the masseteric nerve and artery and uh, vein. Below the head, 
you have the neck of the mandible and or column and uh, around the neck of the mandible you have an inner surface you have a small or shallow fossa which is called pterygoid fossa and this is the place for attachment of the inferior uh, head of the lateral pterygoid muscle inferior head of the lateral pterygoid muscle is uh, inserted to the uh, pterygoid fova around and the inner surface of the neck of the uh, the mandible so <clears throat> then if you go down here, you can see the anterior margin uh, of, the, uh, of the mandible, and anterior margin is continue as an oblique line or oblique ridge, they call it, uh, the external oblique ridge. Uh, that is coming uh, externally, and it's uh, obliquely from superior to the inferior and from posterior to the anterior direction. Then in inner aspect, as we mentioned, uh, uh, in the middle of the ramus of the mandible, you have this mandibular fossa, uh, foramen, that the inferior alveolar nerve artery vein, they are passing. And near to that, above that, you have the small tongue-shaped process, which is called lingula. Lingula, it's uh, a place for the attachment of the ligament, which is called sphenomandibular ligament we are going to discuss is the one of the ligament of the temporomandibular joint it's the sphenomandibular ligament then uh, from this foramen if you go a little bit downward obliquely there is a groove this is called mylohyoid groove or mylohyoid sulcus and through this groove or sulcus it's passing the mylohyoid nerve artery vein. It's a branch of the inferior alveolar nerve. Before that, it goes inside. It gives the uh, branch, which is the mylohyoid nerve. And for vessels, is what mylohyoid uh, artery and vein also it passing. Don't do mistake between the mylohyoid groove, which is immediately below the, mylo uh, the mandibular foramen is going down, and mylohyoid line. Here is the mylohyoid line. The mylohyoid line is placed for attachment of the uh, mylohyoid muscle. And this is very important muscle, the mylohyoid muscle, for the floor of the mouse. So it's separating the floor of the mouse from the submandibular region and topographically is extremely important for the uh, preventing of the spread of the infection uh, uh, to uh, one region to the other region. So here, according to this line, pay attention that they have two fovea. One fovea, which is above and anterior to the mylohyoid line, is called sublingual fovea. It's the place for the location of the sublingual gland, which is the major salivary gland. And below the line, it's and posteriorly is the another fovea, which is called submandibular fovea. It's the place for the another salivary gland which is called submandibular gland, salivary gland. So those are the position which is above and below. So the mylohyoid line, as a matter of fact, then we can say that is separating the sublingual region from the submandibular region that it's very, very important. Uh, regarding the application of the uh, anesthesia for the inferior alveolar nerve. As you see uh, here, it's very important, this anterior margin uh, of the mandible or the, uh, the uh, external oblique ridge that they call it, it's very important. Here, when I want to apply the anesthesia, I put my finger and I touch this part. So I know that medial to that I have to apply because if I do it lateral to that so I go outside and I go to the parotid gland. So here is the landmark for me that to touch this inside the, bone, inside the mouse and you ask the patient to open the mouse maximum uh, like a crocodile and then you apply the anesthesia or the needle to the place that it's called the pterygomandibular space to the fossa uh, collimandibuli here in this region. So here then you do the numbness of the, this is the trigeminal nerve, this is first branch, second branch, and this is the third branch. 
As you see the third branch, it gives the branch which is called inferior alveolar nerve. It goes to the mandibular foramen and mandibular canal, as you see, and it ends up as a mental foramen, as a mental nerve, and it continues also to the incisor region as a, and, prim, and the canine region as an incisive nerve. So here, as you see, before it enters to the uh, mandibular foramen, it gives the mylohyoid nerve, as we mentioned, that it passes to the mylohyoid groove. Yes, mylohyoid line is here. So you do the numbness of the inferior alveolar nerve. So approximately one centimeter in front of that, you will take the needle out and you will do another numbness for another nerve, which is called lingual nerve, which is innervating the lingual surface of the uh, oral cavity. And finally, you inject to the cheek region for the uh, numbness of the long buccal nerve, which is supplying the uh, buccal uh, aspect of the molar region in this region in the vestibular side. So in this case, with this block anesthesia, you have to do the numbness of three main nerves here, the inferior alveolar nerve, the lingual nerve, and long buccal nerve. Here it's showing you the application of the anesthesia for the mental nerve, uh, mental foramen, that uh, it's, uh, it's, we said that is approximately below the apex of the second premolar, and in this case is the area of the numbness of the uh, premolar and canine and incisor, you can do this uh, numbness uh, of, and also the numbness of the lower lip. So for the application of the anesthesia for this three nerve, you see that half of the jaw, it will be anesthetized and you can do the surgical intervention. As we said, one-fifth of the trauma in the face region is belong to the mandible, so uh, we have some uh, usual place of the fracture. Fracture, it can be happened any part, but the most common fracture uh, it can occur in the angle of the mand on the body of the mandible, in the angle of the mandible, in the symphysis menti or mental symphysis, in the neck of the mandible. So, uh, according to the research, we have four predilection sites of the fracture. Uh, one is in the midline, as we mentioned it here. Uh, so, this is like a U-shaped fracture. So, if the lateral part of the face, it's supported by, for example, by wall, yes? And some heat is coming from the side to the mandible, so it's like a U that it will be broken, broken from here, the heat, here it will be supported and the heat it will be here. So usually in the center it will be a fracture. So this is one. Second fracture which is uh, happening it's in the lower canine region, so uh, it's, the, it's the, this part because the canine, it has the longest and uh, largest and the longest uh, and largest root and the strongest root. So the bone around this region is weak and in this case is prone to the infection. Another that you can see it in this picture or this uh, x-ray is the angle of the mandible, which is usually is fracture because the compact bone in this angle is thin, and uh, a spongy bone is, uh, is a softer. And uh, finally, the neck of the mandible is the another site of the most common fracture. So here you can see in the upper part, do you know what is this? Wires, Wires yes. Do you know why? Um, yes, excellent. So you know that if you, fr if you do the fracture of your upper limb or lower limb, what, what the doctor do, does? Put it in the cast. Why? Not move it. Because if, if you move your hand and the fracture line will not heal because always you are moving and the healing is not. So they fix it and they put it in the cast for some period of time that the healing of the bone, it will be com complete. So if you have a, if the patient has fracture of the jaw, so you cannot put the face inside the cast. Yes. So how to fix this jaw together? So we use some wire. This is the intermaxillary fixation. And 
operatives and laboratories by the wire, it will be closed like this, and patient cannot open the mouse. This approximately four till six weeks. What? Yes, exactly, good question. How it eat? Six weeks like this? Just fluid and soft food. The way of the enter to the, from the vestibule of the mouse to the oral cavity proper is the fissure between the teeth, as you see, the liquid it can go, or to the backside of the molar here, there is a space which is called let retromolar space. You can put some strip and then you can eat the soft or liquid film, uh, uh, food. So this is the intermaxillary uh, fixation. It's a, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a good way for the losing of the weight. Usually the patient, they lose approximately uh, 10 kilo uh, uh, sometimes, of course. It depends on how much fluid or soft food he's drinking. So, uh, here is another x-ray that you can see the fracture at the body of the mandible. And here is the 3D reconstruction that you can see the fracture in the mental symphysis here in the midline. Very important, just uh, very quickly, if there is a double fracture in the canine region, is a bilateral fracture. So as we said here in the interior side, there is a mental spine, place for attachment of the genioglossus and genio-hyoid uh, uh, muscles, yes. Those are the muscles that they are pulling the mandible and the tongue, uh, like a protrusion of the tongue outside. And if you have the double fracture, this segment of the mandible, it will be movable. So then there is a, no support for this muscle, and this fragment, together with the tongue, it's going dorso caudally back to the throat, and the tongue will close the airway of the hypopharynx and laryngopharynx, and the patient will suffocate and die because of the obstruction of the respiratory uh, tract. So special uh, attention to the double fracture of the canine region in the anterior aspect of the mandible because of the suffocation of the risk of the suffocation of the patient according to these muscles that we mentioned it. We mentioned it genioglossus, we mentioned geniohyoid descended, we, we mentioned the mylohyoid that is attached to the mylohyoid line together with the stylohyoid and the constrictor muscle of the pharynx, the superior and middle all they are causing that the tongue, it will go in the dorsocranially and it's closing the uh, hypopharynx and oropharynx together. And here is the 3D reconstruction of the fracture in this area that you can see. So, this is the first part that we discussed and the second part is temporomandibular joint. Like uh, each other joint, so you have to say that the temporomandibular joint is between which bones, yes? Between the mandible and temporal bone. And uh, this joint, which part of mandible and which part of the temporal? So the upper part is the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone together, be careful, of with the articular tubercle. So articular tubercle of the squamous part of the temporal bone also is a site for the uh, articular facet in the temporomandibular joint. And this fossa is separating by the tympanic plate of the temporal bone via the suture which is called, the, or fissure which is called the squamotympanic uh, fissure. The lower portion of the, this joint is the head of the mandible that we already uh, discussed, and it's either you can say the head or the condylar process of the uh, mandible. So uh, here is the external cranial base that you can see the mandibular fossa. Sometimes instead of mandibular fossa in some literature, they write it glenoid fossa also. Uh, so uh, anterior to the mandibular fossa, 
the part of the squamous part of the temporal bone, also there is an eminence or tubercle, which is called articular tubercle. This articular tubercle usually is appearing after uh, the milky or the deciduous or the te or uh, temporary teeth is erupting completely. Do you know in which age all the teeth of the child is erupting complete? 12, what, years? No. Two years. After two years, all the milky test, teeth, it must be erupted. So after the two years, then the articular tubercle is starting to, uh, to, to, to form. And uh, 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 also pay attention to the relation between the mandibular fossa and external acoustic meatus. So any damage to this joint, so it can damage to the external acoustic meatus, which is the external ear, which has a close relation with the with the uh, mandibular, uh, mandibular fossa and the temporomandibular joint. So in the case of the, uh, of the uh, heat from the lower part, so if somebody is making a heat from the lower part in the chin region, so the head of the mandible, it can break the mandibular fossa and the connection to the middle cranial fossa. So it going the fracture line to the middle cranial fossa, the connection uh, due to the damage of the mandibular fossa. So if I break this region and I go up there, so I reach to the middle cranial fossa is one of the fossa in the internal cranial base. Uh, this mandibular fossa, as a matter of fact, if we go to the details, so it has two parts, the articular part and non-articular part. And it's these two parts, they are divided by the two fissure the tympanosquamous fissure and very important fissure here, which is called petrotympanic fissure. Through this petrotympanic fissure, it passes two structures very important. One is horda tympani, is a nerve, is a branch of facial nerve, which is cranial nerve number seven, thank you. And also anterior tympanic artery, it's passing through this uh, through this uh, petrotympanic fissure, which is here. So since this fissure is in the non-articular part, so it doesn't engage with the, these two surfaces, they are not damaged, yes? So they are intact. And also some part of the parotid gland, the largest salivary gland that we are going to discuss, also it can reach to this area, but it doesn't involve the articular, articular surface. But it can be involved when you have the parotitis. For example, do you know the viral infection in the parotid gland? It's called mumps. Mumps, it's the swallowing of the parotid gland. Usually it happens in children, so it's enlarged. When it's enlarged, then by the movement of the mandible, you have a severe pain in the parotid gland, so we are going to discuss. So regarding the uh, head of the mandible, which is the condylar process, it's cylindrical shape, so it's usually it's uh, directed a little bit obliquely, so, uh, so uh, it will be uh, ventrolaterally and dorsomedially directed. The transverse dimension is approximately one and a half to two centimeter, uh, and uh, the shape uh, and the size of the head of the mandible is a little bit less than the mandibular fossa, so that's, that's why freely it can rotate inside the fossa thanks to the, uh, to the loosened capsule that it has. And uh, in the condylar hinge axis, you can do some rotation in all direction of the horizontal, uh, sagittal, and vertical direction, so the head of the mandible can be uh, can be uh, rotated. So this is the dissection of the uh, temporomandibular joint that uh, we have it, uh, we have it uh, inside the head, inside the fossa, and this is the articular tubercle, yes? So if accidentally the patient 
open maximum. Maximum opening of the mouth, we are measuring between the distance of the upper central incisor and lower central incisor, yes? And usually it's four till five centimeter. So the patient must open the mouth, so this distance, yeah. This is the normal. And when you are yawing and you open so much or when you have some big part of the foot and you wanted to put, you maximum you open it and suddenly the head of the mandible, because of some reason, some anatomical anomaly or some arthritis or anything, it can go under the tubercle. This tubercle always is stopping for maximum. And then you have heard or you have seen some people, they have lux luxation of the, of the joint. Then they cannot going, go back to the place because the head of the mandible is going in front and then it goes, doesn't go back to the fossa. And then there is a maneuver and a, 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 a structure that it's called hypocratic maneuver that you can press it and down and backward uh, and put it back and replacing the head of the mandible back to this place. So the, what I wanted to mention is that this articular tubercle is preventing the dislocation of the, of the joint, but in some disease or some anatomical abnormality, it can happen, this dislocation. So the type of the joint, it's uh, temporomandibular joint is one of the most complex joint of, the, of your body. So if accidentally one of the joint in one side, it doesn't work, the other also cannot work. So always they are bilaterally. They are symmetrically bilaterally. It must be coordinating this movement. So because of the presence of the articular disc, this joint is called the compound joint. And uh, this uh, also is considered as a synovial joint. And all these articular facets, they are covered by the fibrocartilage structure. And this fibrocartilage, if it damaged, so the healing of this fibrocartilage, like other connective tissue, it's very slowly, and specifically the articular disc that I'm going to discuss, it has a very poor blood supply. So if there is a damage of the disc in the temporomandibular joint, the regeneration of the disc is so difficult. The capsule, as we said, is relatively is lax capsule, is the allowing the movement, and like other capsule in the synovial joint, we have inner layer, which is the synovial membrane, that they are producing the synovial fluid, and it's attaching to the all margin of the articular disc, and the outer surface, which is the connective tissue fibrous membrane, which is outside is uh, superiorly and ventrally attaching to the articular tubercle, Capsule laterally and medially is attaching to the mandibular fossa or articular fossa. Posteriorly, it's attaching to these two fissures, petrotympanic and uh, tympanosquamous fissure or suture, yes, fissure. And uh, inferiorly is attaching to the neck of the, so the capsule is fixing in the lateral, the both side to the neck of the mandible. So here you can see the position of the capsule. The articular disc, which is very important, this disc, it has uh, connected, it has a very important connection with the one masticatory muscle. Be careful, only one masticatory muscle is attaching to the articular capsule and articular disc of the temporomandibular joint, and this is the superior head of the lateral pterygoid muscle. Superior head is attaching to the capsule and the disc of the temporomandibular joint. The shape of the disc, since we have here tubercle and here we have fossa, the shape of the tubercle, uh, the disc is concave here, then it's becoming convex here. For the mandibular, is the lower portion of the disc, it's becoming concave. So sometimes we say biconcave disc or sometimes we, uh, we said it that it's like a saddle shape in the sagittal cross section. The articular disc, it has in posterior aspect, it has two lamella, so that's why it is called bilamellar zones in the posterior part of the disc. So the upper portion is attaching to the posterior part of the mandibular fossa, it's elastic, so it's flexible, 
and the lower portion is attaching to the posterior aspect of the head of the mandible, which is not elastic, so it's connected by the fibrous tissue. So this is one important and very, very important, especially for dentistry. It's that this disc, articular disc, it's dividing the joint cavity to two compartment or two chamber or two parts, upper portion and lower portion. The lower portion is the complex or the compartment between the disc and mandible, condylar portion of the mandible. So they call it discomandibular or discocondylar compartment. Yes, this is very important for the rotational movement when you are doing opening of the mouth, when you are closing the mouth. So it means depression and elevation of the mandible. Then the upper compartment or upper joint cavity is called discotemporal compartment. Yes, so or the temporodiscal compartment. And this is responsible for the gliding movement or trans translational movement. So it's movement anteriorly and posteriorly. So it means they are helping for the, uh, for the specific, specific movement, which is called retraction going back and protraction or protrusion going forward. So the translational movement, it's happening in the upper joint cavity. The rotational movement is happening in the lower joint cavity. So the rotationally, Rotational movement is when you are in the resting position and you open the mouth till two centimeter approximately. So this two centimeter, it's the, it's the range till the rotational movement. After two, two centimeter, if you open it, then it's the moving anteriorly or posteriorly or anteriorly in the opening mouth. So above the two centimeter, so it's the translational movement or gliding movement in the retraction and uh, and uh, protraction. So, uh, regarding the, uh, the ligaments as other joint that you have to say, so we have some ligaments that they are strengthening and reinforcing of the capsule. We have three main ligament and two indirect ligament. The first ligament, which is called lateral ligament or temporomandibular ligament, it's the, in the lateral aspect of the capsule and it's coming from the articular tubercle or zygomatic arch. Posteriorly or dorsally downward is attaching in the lateral aspect of the joint. Another name of the lateral is temporomandibular ligament. Be careful. Then we have the sphenomandibular ligament that we mentioned is originated from the spine of the sphenoid bone or angular spine and is inserted to the lingula lingula that it was near to the mandibular foramen, so origin and insertion of the sphenomandibular ligament. Another ligament is stylomandibular ligament, which is originated from the styloid process of the temporal bone and is inserted to the posterior aspect of the ramus and specifically the angle of the mandible. Then in some literature, since we have lateral ligament, so we have medial ligament, which is in the medial aspect of the temporomandibular, of the capsule, and pterygomandibular ligament or pterygomandibular raffae or bucopharyngeal raffae, the border between buccal region and pharynx, is originated from the hamulus of the pterygoid process of the temporal bone and is going to the area of the behind the third molar in the lower molar, so it's called retromolar area. So this is indirectly, it's a playing role for the reinforcing of this joint and as a matter of fact is limiting the range of the jaw opening. So it's preventing the maximum opening of the jaw. So movement like other jaw, so opening of the mouth is set as a depression or abduction. Open, uh, the closing of the mouth is called elevation or adduction. Pulling the forward mandible is called protrusion or propulsion, and pulling backside is called retrusion or the retraction. They are in the chewing movement, is a complex movement. It's some rotational movement which is called lateral pulsion. So the muscles that they are making the depression, they are mainly one, one factor is gravity. 
So the gravity is helping the depression. Another, a group of muscle which is called suprahyoid muscles, they are uh, anterior, mainly anterior belly of digastric, genio, geniohyoid, and the mylohyoid muscle. And also, for the initial helping of the depression, is playing role very important muscle, which is called lateral pterygoid muscle, because the only muscle which is attaching to the disc and capsule, so is initiating the depression. Elevation of the mandible, which is closing the mouth, or adduction it is, so it's mainly is happened by the temporalis muscle, masseter muscle, and medial pterygoid muscle. The contraction of these three muscles, they are making the, uh, the depression. Protraction, which is the gliding or translation movement forward, usually is happening by the, uh, by the uh, lateral pterygoid muscle, uh, which is assist assisted by the medial pterygoid muscle. Also, the anterior part of the temporalis muscle and superficial part of the masseter muscle is playing role for this protraction. The retraction, it's happening by the, uh, by the uh, posterior part of the temporal and the deep part of the masseter, plus the geniohyoid and digasteric, also they are assisting for the retraction movement. So in this case, if you open the mouse, so there are two things happening, the depression and the protrusion of the mouse can happen. So uh, for the depression also we said that uh, uh, depression and elevation, it's the lower joint cavity for the rotational movement playing role. For the protraction and retraction, the upper joint cavity is playing role and the lateral pterygoid muscle for the initiate, I think, of the depression and also protraction. It has very, very important, important role. The upper uh, head or the superior head is attaching to the capsule and articular disc. The inferior head is attaching to the pterygoid fova in the neck of the mandible. Uh, those are the action of the muscle, and this is the details uh, that uh, I'm going to send you as a PDF this uh, lecture. Uh, then we have the lateral pulsion. It's the combination of the, of the uh, movement in, at the rotation and the propulsion of the, uh, of the joint. For example, if you put the mandible to the lateral, to the right side, it's called lateral pulsion to the right side. So the right side, the head of the mandible in the right side, it's staying in the mandible and a little bit is rotating laterally. But the opposite side, joint, the head of the mandible, it's making the depression and the, or anteriorly and it inferiorly, so it means that the protrusion or propulsion, it can happen. Uh, regarding the, all the muscles that we mentioned it here, it means all the masticatory muscles, they are innervated by the mandibular nerve, the branches of the mandibular nerve. And uh, all the other nerve, like anterior belly of digastric uh, muscle, like anterior belly of digastric mylohyoid muscles, uh, they are innervated by mandibular nerve branch of mandibular, except the geniohyoid, which is the suprahyoid muscle, which is directly innervated by the spinal nerve that they are arising from the segment C1 that we are going to discuss it in the nervous system. Regarding the sensitive innervation, the joint the temporomandibular, you have the pain, some patients, they have pain in the temporomandibular joint. So it must have some sensitive innervation. And the main nerve for the sensitive innervation is the auriculotemporal nerve, which is branch of mandibular nerve again. And there are two nerves in the new literature they are writing is, is the posterior deep temporal nerve and masseteric nerve. Be careful, these two nerves, these two last nerves, they are, as a matter of fact, is the motor nerve, that they are supplying the masticatory muscle, but they found that they are playing role for the sensitive innervation of the temporomandibular joint as well, yes? But the main nerve for the sensitive innervation is auriculotemporal nerve branch of mandibular nerve. This is the thing that we discussed, it, that it dislocated the joint when it's coming uh, beyond the, or anteriorly from the eminence or articular tubercle that you can do the uh, Hippocratic maneuver, so you can put it down and uh, backward, and you can return back the uh, head of the mandible to the condylar fossa. 
during to the operation of the temporomandibular joint, you have to be careful of two very important nerves, uh, the branches of the facial nerve, of course, they are a close relation with this temporomandibular joint, auriculotemporal nerve, which is uh, innervating the sensitive, and the branch of facial nerve, which is called horda tympani. We are going to discuss about this nerve. The examination of the temporomandibular joint, if you put your finger, index finger, in the external ear, and you ask the patient to open the mouth and close the out, you can feel anteriorly the rotation of the head of the mandible under your, the, your, your index finger. Uh, in the case of the um, uh, operation or the uh, treatment of the joint disorder, usually it's the conservative uh, treatment, but we have some intra-articular application of some uh, some treatment material. Also, we can do it the uh, rinsing of the joint by the applying of the two needle. Uh, one needle, you will apply the uh, the uh, the, for example, physiological uh, serum, and the other part, it's the other needle is coming. So it's circulating and it's cleaning the uh, joint cavity uh, uh, during the arthritis or the arthrosis or any. And another method is arthroscopy that with the camera you can go to the joint cavity and you can see the disc and the cavity, how, it, how they are. Those are the, the procedure. But usually we are avoiding of the, any operation to the joint because it's very uh, important and dangerous area according to the topographic anatomy with the other nerve. 20 minutes. <clears throat> so Nick, uh, the teeth is the last subject that we are going to discuss it, extremely important for dentistry and also the general medicine. Uh, maybe it's boring for you, general, but uh, anyway, you have a question about the teeth, so you can pick up the question in oral examination about the teeth as well. So uh, generally, we say that the oral cavity is divided by the two, is divided to two parts, the oral vestibule, which is bordered by the lip and cheek and the teeth alveolar process and the gingiva. It's like a horseshoe. And uh, the other bigger or larger area is the oral cavity proper, which is bordered posteriorly by the isthmus of the fauceum, is the border between oral cavity and pharynx. And uh, down is by the malohyoid, up by the hard and soft palate and anteriorly is by the teeth and alveolar process. So this is the general division of the oral cavity that we are going to discuss it later. And here exactly is the place that we asked. This is the fissure between the teeth in the case of the intermaxillary fixation during the fracture. So you can, through these spaces, the patient can drink some liquid things. Or behind the third, the third molar, so here, there is a space, is a retromolar space that you can uh, eat. Regarding the teeth, you have to pay attention to two terminology. One is diphiodont, the other is heterodont. Diphiodont, it means that the human teeth are formed by the two generation. So we have milky, temporary, primary, or deciduous. All of them is correct. They are, in the number, there are 20. In each quadrant, you have five tooths. We have two incisor, one canine, and two molar. Pay attention, we don't have premolar, and we don't have the third molar. So five in each quadrant, totally we have 20 uh, tooths. Secondary adult permanent teeth, there are 32. Eight, we have it in the each quadrant. Two incisor, one canine, two premolar, and three molar. So four times eight, so it's 32 tooths, teeth. Terminology of the heterodont, it means that the shape of the teeth, they are not same. So according to their function, for example, the incisors, they are using for cutting the food. The canine for the grasping of the food. The premolar and the molars, this is for the grinding of the food. And according to that, we have different shape and different uh, morphology of the teeth. So here you can see the permanent teeth, and here you can see the deciduous teeth that we are going to discuss about the difference. So the, you have to know the difference between the permanent and deciduous teeth. The deciduous teeth, first, uh, the formula is 
2102, it means that two incisor, one canine, zero premolar, and two molar. That's why it's this formula. So the number 20 in permanent 32. Size smaller than the permanent. Color whitish. The permanent is usually they are somehow yellowish, grayish color, yes, but the permanent, the deciduous is the, is the uh, whitish color. It has a thinner enamel, that's why it's whitish. So then they have larger pulp chamber, they have shorter can can uh, crowns, and the pulp horns and the roots, they are more divergent. So you can see the roots, they are more divergent to carry the germ of the germ of the uh, permanent teeth. So the original of the permanent teeth, they are located between the roots of the, of the deciduous teeth and then by the eruption, so they are pushing the, the deciduous teeth out and the resorption of the root, it will be happening. So the root canal usually is the wavy and is tortures and, uh, and uh, uh, the alveolar bone in the uh, children, they are very thin compact, so that's why in children there is no necessary to do the block anesthesia to those foramens that I said, so it's enough to inject the anesthesia near to the tooth, and because of the thin bone, so it's penetrating through the bone and it goes to the nerve, and it's much more comfortable for dentists and also for the children that they don't cooperate to let you to do the injection, yes. So this is the very important aspect that you can use this infiltration injection in anywhere of the, uh, of the jaw. The permanent teeth, that it's the formula of two, one, two, three. So eight, one in each quadrant. So together is 32, but not always is uh, the uh, anatomy is normal. So here is the patient with the 232 teeth. So it's seven hour operation to remove all these teeth from the supernumerary teeth. They call it that it can happen Always the variation is the uh, magic of the gut. So uh, the, about the dental arch, about the dental arch, we have the inferior dental arch and the post superior dental arch. The inferior, it looks like a parabolic shape and the superior is like an ellipsoid shape. So usually the upper jaw is somehow, the dental arch is bigger than the lower jaw. So that's why when you are biting, somehow this upper jaw must covering in some point the anterior and the lateral aspect of the lower jaw in the normal bite, of course, in the normal occlusion. Uh, regarding to the structure of the teeth, so we have the three main parts, the crown, neck, and the root of the teeth. And at the apex of the root of the teeth, you have the foramen, which is called apical foramen, which is the nerve and vessels that are passing and they go to the pulp chamber. Yes, so uh, the structure of the two teeth, they are en enamel is the hardest tissue. The most common tissue is the dentine, which is covering uh, below the enamel and below the cement, which is the, uh, the cement is just covering the area of the root, yes. So those are the uh, structure and those are the uh, uh, some summary about this uh, structural teeth, enamel, dentine, and cementum. Uh, enamel is the hardest tissue, 96% of the or, uh, minerals or inorganic material. The structure, they are looks like a prism. They call it enamel uh, uh, prism. They are uh, structurally is composed of the hydroxyapatite. Uh, they are formed by the cells that they are called ameloblasts, and we have the place that the enamel and the cement they are facing together at the neck of the re uh, of the neck. So usually the enamel is covering the cement in in most of the population. Sometimes they are edge to edge, so it means that that the enamel is finishing and cement is uh, starting. Yes. Sometimes there is a distance, yes? So it means that this part at the neck region, it will not covered by the enamel and it will not covered by cement. So the dentine, it will be exposed. And that's why is the reason that some people, they have sensitive teeth. When you are eating ice cream 
or there is some cold wind it coming to your neck of the teeth, so it's painful because the dentine, it's very painful and it's sensitive to the uh, stimulation. So this is one thing. The other is <clears throat> dentine, which is the most common material or structural uh, 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 material or a structure that you, they make the, uh, the teeth is yellowish whitish color is formed by the cells odontoblasts and the process of the formation of the dentine is called dentinogenesis and the structure of the dentine is called dentinal tubules that they are oriented from the pulp chamber toward the enamel or the cementum. We have three types of the dentine, primary, secondary, tertiary. Primary is uh, forming before the root eruption or tooth eruption and is between the <coughs> enamel and pulp chamber is located. Secondary, it's producing after the root formation and it continues continue with the age is, and tertiary dentine is only due to the stimuli. So for example, you have a caries in the tooth. This caries is penetrating the enamel and is going to the dentine and is closing to the pulp chamber. So you have the defense mechanism that the, when it's closing to the pulp chamber here, the cells, the odontoblasts near to the pulp chamber, they are starting to produce a tertiary dentine, which is protecting the microbes or bacteria to go to the pulp chamber, otherwise you have the pulpitis. So this is the important. And cement, which is produced by cementoblast, is bone-like uh, substance and is a part of the fixing of the tooth in the, in the socket, which is called period, parodont, uh, periodontium. Uh, that we are going to discuss, and dental pulp that is composed of the soft tissue like a nerve vessels. Uh, regarding the innervation of the teeth, we have for the upper jaw, the main nerve is the maxillary nerve, second branch of trigeminal, which is giving the superior, uh, posterior, superior medial, and superior anterior alveolar nerve. We discussed it before. The teeth of the lower jaw is branch of the mandibular nerve, is the third branch. It's made, giving the branch as the inferior alveolar nerve. All these nerves above the apex of the tooth, they are making the superior and inferior dental plexus. So here you can see, here is the trigeminal nerve. This is the second branch and this is the third branch. And here you can see above the apex of the tooth, the nerves, they are making a plexus. And then from this plexus, they are giving the nerves to the apical foramen and it goes to the pulp chamber. So this is the superior dental plexus and this is the inferior dental plexus and here is the mental <coughs> foramen. Inferior alveolar nerve, it's innervating as we mentioned it, uh, the teeth of the lower jaw. So it's, end, uh, it's going to the mandibular uh, foramen, it's end up as a mental foramen as a mental nerve, and also it continue as an incisive branch to the supplying of the first mol, uh, premolar canine and incisor, and the mental nerve, as we said, is innervating the chin and the lower lip. The, the superior or the upper jaw, we already mentioned it, that we have three nerves, posterior superior and middle superior and anterior superior, for the innervation of the molar, premolar, and uh, frontal teeth, that they are branches of the maxillary nerve and directly for the posterior and indirectly from the infraorbital uh, nerve is coming. For the gingiva, more or less the same, but in the lower jaw, in the lingual surface, we is innervated by the lingual nerve, and for the area of the molar region is innervated by the buccal nerve. For the upper jaw, the palatine side is innervated by the greater palatine nerve uh, till the canine or premolar. And for the canine, an incisor is innervated by the nasopalatine nerve that we discussed it in the incisive foramen. The, the uh, vessels, the arteries, be careful, all the arteries that they are supplying upper and lower they are branch of maxillary artery, the most common mistake. We don't have mandibular artery, yes? This maxillary artery, it gives the 
superior alveolar artery that they are divided, subdivided to posterior, middle, and anterior, and the inferior alveolar artery also is branch of maxillary artery, be careful. Uh, the buccal gingiva is the same as that we said it in the nerve. The vein, the main venous drainage is the pterygoid venous plexus, which is located in infratemporal fossa. And uh, also uh, some small amount is going to the facial vein, which is finally from the pterygoid plexus, it goes to the maxillary vein, retromandibular vein, and jugular venous system. We said about the dangerous, about the emissary vein, which is spreading of the infection from extracranial to the intracranial in the practical, we said. And the lymphatic drainage that uh, I show you to you, the mostly they are going to the submandibular lymph node, the frontal segment to the submental lymph node, and the upper third molar is going directly to the superior deep cervical uh, lymph node. So those are the vessels that we already mentioned it. And this is the venous plexus, the pterygoid venous plexus that I said that be careful of application of the block anesthesia in the tuber maxilla or maxillary tuberosity for posterior superior alveolar nerve block. So here is this. And uh, here is the uh, vessels that they are going, uh, alveolar nerve, it gives dental artery which is going to the uh, canal, the apical foramen to the pulp chamber, and it's supplying also the lower one-fourth of the periodontium and interalveolar or interradicular branch that is supplying the rest of the periodontium and the gingiva in the upper side. And this is the lymphatic drainage that we said, mainly submandibular lymph node, frontal segment to the submental lymph node, the upper third molar is going to the deep, su superior deep cervical uh, lymph node. The uh, marking of the teeth, uh, we have four quadrant, the upper right, which is by one, uh, lower, uh, left upper, left lower, and the uh, uh, right lower. So one, two, three, four. It's the quadrant according to the ISO or the FDI notation. Uh, here is the sh numbering two digital system, numbering of the teeth by the permanent. So it means that the first number is the quadrant and second number is the number of the T's. And for the deciduous T's, we have one, two, three, four. And for deciduous T's is five, six, seven, eight. So this is important. Then either you can use also this quadrant as a letter. If it is a small letter, it means the deciduous T's. If it is permanent, it's the permanent T's. And also you can use the plus or minus, which is plus for the upper jaw, minus for the lower jaw. Uh, periodontium is very important. It's the structure that they are fixing the tooth inside the socket, and they are composed of cement, periodontal ligament, gingiva vessels, and alveolar bone. Those are very important for the transforming of the chewing pressure to the, to the this ligament, to the, to the uh, tensile stress. Uh, and uh, the ligaments, we divide them according to their location as a, uh, as a circular ligament and transeptal ligament uh, for the gingival fiber. For the alveolar fiber, we have the alveolar crest uh, uh, ligament for horizontal ligament, oblique ligament, which is very important uh, that it's preventing the forcing of the tooth inside the button of the socket is the most common ligament, and this is the apical ligament. This is the last ligament that is keeping the tooth inside the socket if you want to take it out. Uh, uh, since I have this one, so just very quickly one question. What will happen, what you will do if suddenly if there is an accident, there is fight or something, somebody punching to your face, and you say, oh, you just, oh my God, and suddenly you see that the tooth, it's come out from your this. What do you do? Yes. What? Putel? Yes. Uh, uh, this is one. If you know it, so it's better if it is clear, if it didn't broke, broken, if it is, everything is okay. If you are a dentist or you know a medical student, so the best one, because the time is playing role for you, the most important, yes? As soon as you put it back, so there is a 
saving of the tooth, it's the, the risk or the percentage of the saving of the tooth is important, yes? Otherwise, you lose this tooth and you have to do implant or denture or something and there is a lot of money for you, yes? So if you know it, so you can return it back and go to the dental emergency, yes? If you don't know it to do, so carry it to the dental emergency as soon as possible where either you can put it inside your mouth, in your saliva, this is the best one, but if you are drunk and you put it in the mouth and you go to the dentist, he said, yes, I have it, where is it, I, I swallowed, <laughs> then it's, uh, it's difficult to take it out. So then uh, another option is the best medium is milk, for example, yes? Put it in the milk and as soon as possible till half an hour if you reach to the dental office so there is a, a possibility to, to save. This is the gingiva that uh, it's a modification of the socket, if the, if, of the mucous membrane. We have free gingiva, attached gingiva, and alveolar uh, mucosa for dentistry in periodontology. Uh, you can see it then later. Uh, what is important is that if you don't do this uh, uh, dental hygiene, you can cause the gingivitis. So recommend you to brush your teeth, but proper brushing of the teeth. You can see there is the abrasion of the tooth because the, the brushing is like this. So you are removing all the material of the tooth from the here. In normal gingiva, it's pinkish, is without painless. If you have mal hygiene, so you can see dental calculus here, uh, horrible, so there is a gingivitis here in this region can happen. And also due to the pregnancy, also it can cause the gingivitis uh, in this area. Those are the direction of the two uh, teeth according to the occlusal, vestibular, lingual, palatine, mesial, and this style uh, is a direction that uh, I will send it as a PDF to you. This is the morphological structure that the dentistry, they will have it in the phantom. So here you have it, uh, the new uh, information according to the literature 2022. Uh, and uh, here there are the tooth. And also you have to know the eruption of the tooth. The time of the eruption of the permanent teeth and the time of the eruption of the deciduous teeth. Do you know which, uh, when the first milky teeth is erupting? six months, six till eight months, the first incisor, and first uh, permanent tooth that is erupting? When? Six years, yes, and is usually the first lower molar it is. So this is the things. Uh, of course, the bad things is the, uh, the, the wisdom teeth that now it is because of your diet, so there is no place for that, and most of the people is making a, a difficulty. Uh, this is the occlusal uh, normal bite of the patient, and this is the uh, terminology about the different bite of the patient. And uh, this is the articulation curve, and the last slide is the uh, removing this material, attrition, abrasion, is the physical removing, erosion is chemical, uh, gingival resection and alveolar reduction is the uh, is the atrophizing of the things. So thank you for your attention and uh, see you sometimes. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> if you have any question, I'm here. <clears throat>